thank you, Allison, so much for that song. To President Clinton and First Lady Michelle Obama, to Guy Johnson, Colin, Stephanie, the entire family, our Thanksgiving family, those of us who consider ourselves family. <laughs> I, uh, I remember the first time I heard that phrase, God put a rainbow in the clouds. I was in utter despair and distraught and had called Maya. I remember being locked in the bathroom with the door closed, sitting on the toilet seat. And I was crying so hard, uh, she could barely understand what I was saying. And I had, uh, I was upset about something that I can't even remember now what it was. Isn't that how life works? And I'd called for a long distance cry on her shoulder, but she wasn't having it. She said, as you all know, she could, stop it. <laughs> stop it now. And I said, what, what, what did you say? And she said, stop your crying now. And I continued to sniffle and she said, did you hear me? <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, only she could level me to my seven-year-old self in an instant. And she said, I said, why do you want me to sit up, right? I'm trying to explain to you what happened. And she says, I want you to stop and say thank you. Because whatever it is, you have the faith to know that God has put a rainbow in the clouds. And You're going to come out on the other side of whatever it is, the better for it. She was in all ways, no matter the time of day or night or the situation, she was always there for me to be the rainbow. And I'm here today to say thank you, to acknowledge to you all and to the world how powerful one life can be, the life of Maya Angelou. The loss I feel, I cannot describe. It's like something I have never felt before. She was my spiritual queen mother and everything that that word implies. She was the ultimate teacher. She taught me the poetry of courage and respect. Many a day I'd ask her for advice while trying to navigate the pitfalls of fame, of a public life when somebody had written or said something hurtful and untrue, and she'd say, baby, you're not in it. You're not in it when they wrote it, when he sat down at the typewriter. That's how long we've been talking. <laughs> she'd say, those people can't hold a candle to the light God already has shining on your face. Can't you see it? She'd say, look up, look up and see the light. When I was on trial in 1998 in Texas for saying something bad about a burger, <laughs> yes, for six weeks I was on trial sued by the Texas cattlemen. Mama Angelo came to Texas with a prayer posse. And 
We all know that Maya was a force all by herself, but the force came with backup. <laughs> they prayed all day and all night long, and Maya would sit in the courtroom while I testified. The prosecuting attorneys didn't know what hit him. <laughs> Warrior Mom had arrived in Amarillo. And it was at the same time that I met Dr. Phil, who was coaching me on how to behave in the courtroom, and he'd say, look in the jurors' eyes. And Maya said, no, look above their heads. <laughs> look above their heads. She said, look above their heads and stand still inside yourself and know who you are. You are God's child, she told me. And in God, you move and breathe and have your being. Of course, we won that trial. <laughs> and every other one I faced, she was always there holding me up, holding me up to know myself, to see the light that God already had shining on my face. Yes, I will, I will miss her. Stedman Gale and I recently came to visit and just sit and be with her and when I walked into the room her eyes lit up and she greeted me as she always did in person or on the phone and she said hello you darling girl <laughs> she'd taken a liking to the iPad I gave her and I love that all of her notes began with oh deario and ended with love ma Maya Angelou. When her mother, Vivian Baxter, told her at age 17, you know, baby, you may be one of the greatest women I've ever known, she didn't know that she was prophesying what we all now know to be true. Maya Angelou is the greatest woman I have ever known. in all the ways that only she could define what it means to be, in her words, a real woman and not just an aging female, <laughs> but a proud to spell my name, W-O-M-A-N kind of woman. She had many daughters throughout the world, Stephanie and Rosa, Matima. Her great gift to us is that she made every one of us feel like we were the one. She made us feel heard and seen and loved and special and worthy. You alone are enough, she taught me. And I am the woman I am today because she was. She not only existed as she proclaimed in her poem, Tall Trees, she thrived to help other people do the same. And indeed, as she said, we can be better and do better because she existed. You know, I still, I marvel at God. I am just in awe that I, a little colored, then Negro girl, growing up in Mississippi, having read I know why the caged bird sings. And for the first time, reading a story about someone who was like me, I, I marveled that from the first page, what you looking at me for, didn't come to stay, only came to say, happy Easter day. I was that girl who had done Easter pieces and Christmas pieces. I was that girl who loved to read. I was that girl who was raised by my southern grandmother. I was that girl who was raped at nine. So when I first met Maya Angelou in the late 70s in Baltimore as a young news reporter and begged her to do an interview with me, and I said, I promise, I promise, I promise, if you just give me your time, I promise it will only be five minutes. And at the end of four minutes and 58 seconds, I told the cameraman, done. And Maya Angelou looked at me and said, who are you, girl? <laughs> I 
First we became friendly and then sister friends and the first time she told me I was her daughter, I knew I had found home. Sitting at her kitchen table on Valley Road, she was reading Paul Lawrence Dunbar, little brown baby with sparkling eyes. That was my favorite place to be at the kitchen table or sitting at her feet, leaning over her lap, laughing out loud for real. Soaking up all the knowledge, all the things that she had to teach, the grace, the love, all of it. My heart was full. Rarely did we ever have a phone conversation where I wasn't taking notes. She was always teaching when you learn, teach, when you get, give. I was a devoted student of Maya Angelou's, learning up to our very last conversation the Sunday before she died. It has been difficult for me to try to put into words what it means to lose, as Cicely said, a rock. She was my anchor. So it's hard to describe to you what it means when your anchor shifts. But I realized this morning I really don't have to put it into words. What I have to do is live it. Because that's what she would want. She would want me, you, us to live her legacy. I remember when I opened my school in South Africa and I said to her, oh Maya, this is going to be my greatest legacy. And she said, not so fast. <laughs> your legacy, she said, is every woman who ever watched your show and decided to go back to school. Your legacy is every man who decided to forgive his father. It's every gay person who decided to come out because they saw a show of yours. Your legacy is every person you ever touched. Your legacy is how you lived and what you did and what you said every day. So true, Sister Maya. I want to live your legacy. We want to live your legacy as you touched us all. Each of us who knew her, those only touched by her words or those who were able to be blessed to sit at the kitchen table. We are next in line to be a Maya Angelou to someone else. It's a challenge that I embrace with my whole heart. I cannot fill her shoes, but I can walk in her footsteps to carry and pass on to the next generation what she knew so well what she tried to teach all of us. We are more alike than we are different. When I see you, I'm really just looking at myself in a different costume. I am human and therefore nothing human is alien to me, she used to teach. So we must carry on and pass on, lifting humanity up, helping people to live lives of purpose and dignity to pass on the poetry of courage and respect. That is what she would want. That is what we will do. And I know I will do it in a way that she most would want. In my last conversation with her, I was telling her about going to film the movie Selma. And she said to me, as she always said when I was doing any kind of job, she said, baby, I want you to do it, and I want you to take it, take it all the way. Yeah.